All right. So good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us this uh, Sunday evening um, and as part of our uh, WBSA uh, High Performance Webinar Series uh, brought to you by Cecil. Um, we're delighted this evening to um, welcome Coach Doug Gardner from uh, the University of Texas Arlington. Uh, their men's team are uh, currently the uh, collegiate champions uh, in, in the USA, and uh, uh, Coach Gardner has been uh, been around for a while on the wheelchair basketball scene, and you've probably seen a lot of his uh, his videos, etc., on, on on YouTube. So very fortunate that uh, Doug is giving up some of his Sunday to to present to us. Um, just before we get started, guys, the normal house housekeeping rules: um, please let uh, Coach Gardner finish the presentation. If you have any questions, uh, just put them in the chat, and at the end of his presentation, we will handle that. And uh, yeah, your microphone's on mute. So um, thank you very much. Coach Gardner. over to you. Thank you very much. All right, great. Thank you for having me. And uh, we were just talking about how great it is for you guys to be putting these programs together and working on your development and high performance and getting more people involved. So really excited to be here. Uh, one of my passions, I've been in wheelchair basketball since 1992, um, grew up coaching in juniors and moved to the college division. I'm also a, a IWBF international classifier. And to me, if that's something you can do and learn more about, that's really helped me understand training speed and training player development uh, by having a good understanding of functional capacity. So I'll mention that a little bit in the presentation, but, but I'm going to be talking about speed today because even if you don't have those bigs getting in the paint and giving you those easy baskets, you can still uh, control the pace of a game and control a game using your speed. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and screen share here. And we will get started. Okay, so speed development for wheelchair basketball. Um, one of the things I tried to do as I grew into the college division from the junior division was uh, look at how we could change the game. How can we make things better? How can we do things better? One of the areas that I really wanted to understand more was, was speed development. So I take a little bit of out of the box look at speed. Um, of course, some of the things that a lot of people do, but I try to bring a few different things to the, the formula as well. So um, my screen is not moving. I don't know why. Let me see if I can get a, a different screen up. All right, so now maybe we can move here. Okay. Okay, so I look at, at speed and I, I've worked a little bit in the speed world and the able body world and try to figure out how can we transfer an understanding of speed to, uh, to wheelchairs. So I look at it as force, power, mechanics, and balance stability is core work. What can we do in core to make us faster? So speed is more than going fast. Uh, I look at it as the reaction time from when an athlete sees, recognizes a stimulus into what comes next. So it's reaction time, getting that push, which means getting the body prepared, getting the hands on the wheels um, at the right angles, the process of acceleration, and then after acceleration, translating that push from a power push to a speed push. And then it's a deceleration is dictated by the need and recognition of the next movement. And so that basically is, are you gonna get a charge? Are you gonna get an offensive foul? Or are you going to avoid an offensive foul? So how much you decelerate, how much you change direction based on your read of the situation and then stopping. Now, how many times do we see players get 
not the smartest fouls in the world just because they don't recognize and stop their chair. So it's not just going fast, but it's the process of going as fast as you can for the situation that you're part of. Okay, so some of the things I look for in speed is hand speed, which is basically a lot of players will finish their push at the front of the push and then it takes too long to get your hands back up to the top of the push to go into the next push. So I tell them that the push isn't finished until they get their hands back to the top. So how many pushes can you get in based on space and based on time? And then understanding acceleration from those first few pushes. What are the factors to getting, generating as much power as you can in as least time as you can? Quickness which is reacting to uh, the stimulus around you. And then one of the biggest things that we figured out is that mental focus and decision-making. How many times have you as coaches or you as athletes have said you need to focus? Well, the first part of speed is focusing and being in the present mentally. Because if you're not in the present mentally, you're going to be a half second behind in recognizing what you need to be doing. Reading and reaction time, and then sports specific. So there's going to be track speed and basketball speed. Um, we train for muscular endurance. And these aren't any specific order. Um, changing direction, and what I'm talking about in changing direction is being able to change direction at the fastest speed possible. So being able to decelerate just enough to change direction and not lose control of your chair. Um, we had an athlete and he got a new chair and he was so excited to use it. He got in the gym, he was pushing, it was great fit. He was pushing super hard. And then he tried to turn the chair without slowing down enough. And of course, what did he do? He went sliding across the floor. So that changing direction is changing direction as quickly as possible. And then deceleration, which helps in change of direction. So focus and reaction time, range of motion. One of the things I see that affects a player's ability to push is maybe they're so tight because of lack of flexibility, they don't have the range of motion to really lift up in the shoulders into that next push. So when we stretch a lot and we do bands and we do prehab, we talk about you can't be so muscle bound for lack of a better word that you can't get your hands or your arms or your shoulders into that next push. So we spend, we spend time working on that in every practice. We warm up with um, active stretching and then we'll close with more static stretching, which is uh, stretch and hold. But our guys like to come in and then shoot, 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 shoot. Oh, we got to stretch. Um, so we have to force them into pushing for six to 10 minutes to get their muscle flowing, their bodies warm or you're not gonna maximize your stretch time. We talk about power, which is how quickly you can do something over a, a set period of time. So when we do our preseason testing, our training, our postseason testing, we're looking at what are we doing specifically to develop power, those first two pushes. How can you generate the most power? We, we were talking before the meeting about um, the um, strength to body weight ratio. How much power does it take for different body weights? If you watch uh, Gran Canaria, Jorge Sanchez plays, and when he came to us as a freshman, he was uh, about 196 pounds. So sorry, I don't know the metric translation on that. But when he left, he was about 156. So he basically lost 40 pounds. He was much faster. He was much faster because of that. And then one thing, if I'm trying to help somebody get faster, is we look at how's the chair set up, 
the seating position and the strapping. How much can you use your legs? How much can you use your trunk? How can you generate some rollover in the shoulders in your low pointers in your class ones who don't have the, uh, the uh, functional capacity to lean, use their back and abs to lean into and come up on their push. So uh, that's where that's one place where functional capacity is going to help you as a coach determine strapping and chair setup to maximize speed. And then we talk about technique. So when, when we talk about technique, um, I think later in here, I, I have a picture of a clock. When we're starting our push, we're starting with our hands. I like just about between 12 and one o'clock. So from the top to one o'clock. I see a lot of people starting their push with their hands back at 10 o'clock. And to me, that's almost an uphill push before they get into the forward push. So we wanna translate horizontal speed going forward versus vertical speed where the, the power and the energy is going down. And so looking at technique, how long is the hand on the push rim? How long is the hand off the push rim getting into the next push? And then how fast are the hands going when they hit the push rim? And that will, that will determine technique and how effective the technique is. So I, you see a lot of players and they'll push forward at three o'clock, their hands come off the push rim and their hands go forward. And to me, that's time wasted instead of going through three o'clock, through the bottom, almost like a track push, cranking the wrist, and then you're already moving back into the next push. So the push is more like an elliptical or circle movement versus um, a piston movement of forward and back, forward and back. Technique may also be dictated by the size wheels that a player uses. Um, we've had guys go from 27 to 26 just so they could get more hand speed and more uh, and quicker hands back to the top of the push. And then your conditioning. So when we do our conditioning, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute when we do our preseason, uh, but we're looking at strength, power, cardiovascular conditioning, muscular endurance conditioning. And so when we talk about the drills that we have coming up, we'll use these drills in different ways depending on what we're working at the time. If we're working just straight speed, we're gonna have more rest time than if we're working muscular endurance where we wanna do drill, come back, do drill, come back and get more drills into the same amount of time. So when we work our sprints, we may work a baseline to a far free throw sprint and turn around and at every 10 seconds, we start a new sprint down the end of the floor. Or we may every 20 seconds, which will be more simulating a game type experience, or we may go sprint 30 second rest because we don't want to be working speed when our arms are tired. We want to work speed when our arms are fresh. So we'll do less repetitions with more rest. Okay, so we talked about reaction time and I, I stole this from um, our military and our, our state police use this drill um, and it's called the OODA loop or observe, orient, decide, and act. So whoever can get through this loop the quickest is going to be a faster pusher and they're gonna be more agility in their push. So observe is what do you see happening? Orient is, okay, these are all the things that are going on. There's a player coming in on the right. There's a player coming in on the left. Um, Decide means, okay, based on all the feedback I'm getting right now, this is what I'm going to do and then act. So if you watch some of the drills we're going to do or show, or you watch a player in a game, 
the ones that can be in position quicker because they've gone through, observe, orient, decide, boom, this is why I'm going. Those are the players that are going to be more effective de defensively for sure. And so training for this loop, we do a lot of game-like drills and a lot of simulation drills to help the players get in the practice and get in the habit of making decisions quicker. And that means I know that player, I know what they like to do, I know where they're going to go, I know what, as a defender, I'm going to use my speed to take away what they want to do. Uh, last time one-on-one, -on -one, this person came at me and beat me going right. Do I think he's going to go right again? Do I take away his right and prepare to uh, react going to the left? So all these are decisions you're making as players and your players are making. And the ones that do it quicker are, are going to be the ones that are more successful. It's based on how much experience they have, how much experience at what speed do they have. So when I'm watching junior players and I'm recruiting, I'm looking at their decision making and how quickly and effectively they learn lessons on the floor against other athletes. So to me, the reaction time and this decision-making loop are super important in speed, uh, especially game speed, speed on the court. So we'll come in in the fall and we can't do regular practices until October 1st. So we starting early August through September, we'll do strength and conditioning, flexibility and speed training. And so it's very intentional what we do uh, based on what I see as our needs going into the next week or the next month or into the season. So we'll come in and spend three hours. Um, we'll have a strength session, a speed session and a cardio session. So for strength, we may be on the, the weight machines. For speed, we'll come in and we'll work different speed drills with rest. So maybe instead of six sprints in a minute, we'll do two. But we only work in speed and that means hand speed, hand technique, and um, generating that quick start into a quick full court push. And then we'll do cardio. So we'll do cardio just about every day and we'll either do um, muscular endurance or we'll do cardiovascular. So maybe we'll do a 12 minute push or maybe we'll do a 30 minute drill. We'll do something to work cardio into a game speed type situation. Tuesday, we add uh, med balls and we'll do plyometric training. So we'll, we'll demonstrate some uh, plyometric training here on some of the videos we have. And then we'll work cardio again. We'll go through this for about, about three hours every morning. And then the guys come back in the afternoon and just do scrimmages. And we'll, we'll just change up lineups to help them in their decision-making. So depending on who's their lineup, What's their role? Where are the other people going to be? How strong can you make a pass to a, a new player? So they're all working their decision-making um, within the scrimmage lineups. Okay, so we'll look at a, a med ball and plow metric drill that we do. I'll tell you what we're looking for in these drills. It's one of our interns. So we use interns from the uh, kinesiology department to help us with our program. Sorry, sorry, Doug, we can't see that particular screen. You can't see the video? No. Uh-oh. Hmm. Okay, let's try this.
Got it? Yep, got it now. Okay. So, our players will be sitting in their wheelchair and then they'll have a partner who will hold them from behind. Uh, we don't have a sound, uh, Coach. No sound? No. Uh, well, I'll talk you through it then. So really we're looking at the, the rotation at the trunk, rotation of the shoulders. And so you're more functional, your four fives, your fours, your threes, they're gonna do more rotation in the, the trunk and the hips. And your ones, one fives, twos are looking at how much rotation can they get in the shoulders. If it's none, they're still dealing with, okay, in a game situation, how can I generate some effectiveness in my shoulders? So I think we're going to talk Jimmy through something here where he doesn't rotate. So here's the, the low pointers. We just want to see the bounce out of when the ball comes back. So the ball comes back. We want to rotate out and boom. That's the plyometric part where the ball loads when he brings it back and then into the wall. We really want to explode out of that loading. So we talk about 30 seconds left, 30 seconds right, and then switch. And the partner who's holding will then um, do the med ball. And we'll do four to six sets of the med ball on this. And so mostly what I'm talking about is maximizing anything a player can do. I talked about your, your low pointers are gonna be on the backrest. And they're going to take that ball and they're going to learn how to roll on the backrest into the plyometric motion, which means coming out of that bounce into the wall again and generating power. So now we'll go back to here. All right. So Whatever core the athlete has, we want to try to uh, access that core for balance and stability. This is, they need to learn how to use the backrest, how to roll on the backrest. Um, your high pointers need to learn how to coordinate your uh, upper rotation with your lumbar rotation. So this would be part of our med ball workouts. Now I got to stop. So with our guys, we'll, we'll use med balls anywhere from two kilogram up to about an eight kilogram med ball. What we're trying to force the body to do is stabilize the, the different weight. So with, I was just talking about, we'll do about six, six sets of 45 seconds. Now we're adding a little range of motion or a little core. So imagine that and you see the, the girl on the left is keeping her arm straight. This We don't want this as an arm exercise. We want this as a shoulder exercise and then a trunk exercise. 
So they're tapping backwards on the ball in whatever range of motion they have, whatever functional capacity they have. You see the girl on the right trying to use her hips to stay balanced as far out as she goes. And, and I don't care how far out they go. What I care about is um, learning how far out they can go. So imagine about, about eight kilograms for our bigger guys and making sure that they're keeping their arms straight. So their shoulders are doing the work. Their trunk, their shoulders, their chest are doing the work. And I'm just talking about using the, uh, the higher level med ball. So our guys, our guys will make this kind of competitive, like, oh, you're just using two kilograms. I'm using six. And, uh, and it just becomes kind of a fun thing to do. Um, between them. And, and it helps them push each other. So it says on here, um, three times on the right side on the twist and then and three times on the left. So we'll do a minute, three times on the right, stop, turn, three times on the left and then switch athletes. And we'll use that just as one of the, um, uh, one of the rotations in a workout. So we might have five groups of three or five groups of four and um, then that's one of the stations they're going to do. So that'd be about a five minute station after stopping the clock to rotate and, uh, and change which athletes actually doing the work. On this one, four to six sets at 45 seconds. So 45 seconds, 15 second rest. So we'll run the game clock and they'll keep on the clock and they'll know when to start and when to rest. Now, if we're trying to do, um, train fresh muscles, we might do four to six sets at 30 seconds just to see if they're more effective with more rest. Okay, now we're looking at power. And let's see. just music in the background right now. All right. So you might recognize Rose Hollerman. So what I'm looking at is taking that push forward, bringing it around through the bottom past six o'clock and back up in the top. So now we're generating, this is just first two pushes. Generating power in the first two pushes. So we're talking about here is generating power in the back because once you go forward with your push, you use your back and your triceps to get your hands back up to the top. So now we're developing the back muscles and triceps. Even if it's a low pointer, they're only gonna go as forward as far as they can. But we're looking at reps. Okay, sometimes we don't think about um, our arm work as developing speed, but we're gonna look at getting the plyometric. So the ball comes in, the arms come in with the ball and then explode out without stopping. So we wanna do that little bounce right at the end and explode out and uh, make it more of a plyometric or a, a, a power type. So I'm just talking about this, the explosion from bringing the ball in and out quickly.
when we do this as partners, um, sometimes they'll catch it and stop and then just generate power from the stop, but we don't want that. We want the ball coming in and exploding out quickly. So we'll do an exercise like this for depending 30 seconds to 45 seconds. At 45 seconds, they would switch. The player in the back comes to the front. Six sets of 10. Uh, we're talking about plyometrics and younger athletes. Younger athletes are still developing their growth plates. And so uh, depending on what studies you're reading, you generally don't want to do the heavier plyometrics until they are uh, a little bit older, like maybe 12 to 14 or older, mostly body weight stuff, 12 to 14. So maybe a body weight plyometric would be push up position and then pushing up, doing a clap, putting your hands back on the ground. So it's body weight. It's something that they're, they're using every day, but uh, it's not with any type of resistance other than the body weight. And I coached gymnastics for 27 years, so uh, mostly younger females. So we did a lot of plyometrics without resistance. Okay, so, so there's the clock. I don't know how to amp up on this page, but when I'm looking at hands on the wheels, and we'll talk about this with reaction time, one o'clock is a good starting position. You go through three or four and then you push through the bottom and back up to the top. Okay, Corey was one of our newer athletes. He was a college football player. Uh, football is in American football. And uh, he missed sport. He missed sport in his life. He missed being around the guys. And so he came back to school um, and is learning wheelchair basketball. So this was his first full year. And we're going to talk about uh, the decision making and what we do to work some decision making. So we have different arm starting positions. I'll do an auditory call. I'll say left or right. They have to react, put their hands on the wheels in the right position and turn and go. And I only do this like to the free throw line. We're just working the reaction time and the start. So you can watch Corey because he's new. You can watch him go through different iterations of hearing my command, putting his hands on the wheels and making that first push. So I'll call left or right and we'll We'll do different starting positions just so it's not the same. So you saw Corey, he brought his hands down, put him in a regular starting position, and then had to adjust his start after he already had his hands on his wheels. So that's not an efficient start. And this is what I'm talking about in the video. He's got to be able to hear what side I call and put his hands on the wheels right in the right position to make that turn different starting position. And he did a little bit better getting that second hand into the turn. Now he's gonna do the, the, the start with a ball. So we kind of accelerated the process here, but I'll call left or right. He'll have to turn, put the ball on the ground and initiate his push in the most effective way. So relatively new player, I thought he was going to be a two, I think more 1.5, different starting position, call it out. So it's funny, you'll see the players start anticipating. So they're in their minds, aren't really focused on what I'm saying. They're thinking, okay, he did left three times in a row. This one's got to be right. And they all want to make that race to the free throw line by anticipating. And that's good. I like it when they're anticipating because they need to learn those anticipation skills 
not just when they're right, but when they're wrong. Oh man, he said left, I thought right, how am I going to adjust to this and keep up? And I'll see players who uh, start at the year, they'll just give up. Oh, I guessed wrong and they won't even try. And that's part of the learning process. So getting them so focused that they're not really thinking about what I'm going to say, they're just focused on listening and reacting to what I'm going to say. If that makes any sense. And next. Okay, so we will do this way for reaction time so that more athletes can be going at the same time. So you can have five lined up on the uh, half court line. So you see quickly adjust his hands, turn. And then they'll all race down to the end of the volleyball line or the free throw line at the other end. So you can probably have five going at a time on this one. One thing on this is you can also do a visual cue. So you can stand at one end on a chair or a ladder or a stand. They're all facing the same wall and you raise a right hand or you raise a left hand. And so you're training and uh, in memory and physiology, we're training those dendritic connections, the dendrites. We're growing dendritic connections in the brain, fo forcing them to focus on making an auditory read, a, a, a visual read, and then responding to that read. Moving through here, trying to get through a little quickly. Okay, this one is called an L drill. So it's three meters from the blue to the orange. Then they come back to the blue, around five meters. So you see a lot of things going on in this. You see acceleration deceleration into the backward pull. And then when they get back to the blue cone, they can either do a, a 180 spin or they can do a J cut and go. And this is another thing, you can start with different commands. Forward, back, making the turn a figure eight. So we're looking at how they transfer weight in that turn and then acceleration right out of that. And, I would have liked to see better acceleration out of that, into that last sprint. So here, these are, we have a lot of different acceleration drills. Okay, these are 180s. So working on that pull. And I want you to see like right here. So if you're not working your full range of motion in your bicep curls, so look, his arms are fully extended, okay? So because of that, that's the end of a bicep curl, all right? So he's fully extended and now he's got a pull. So if you're not working your biceps to full extension, you're not getting that last, that last bit of the bicep that's gonna to contribute to this. So he pulls back and one hard push in. And we really wanna work that one hard push in. That's what we're trying to work. A hard pull and a hard push.
So Bryce is a senior. <laughs> All right, so now we'll add a ball to it. And they've got to have their eyes up, eyes up. And we want to move the ball around. We want to move the pass around. And what you'll see is if they don't get a hard stop, they keep rolling on past the line. So we want to practice that hard, hard stop on that because that's the difference between a charge and a block. So we'll do those for maybe a minute at a time. Here's Fabian. Fabian's playing uh, in Spain professionally now. He's he's the leading scorer in the European League from what I hear. So um, good offensive drill, but a really good defensive drill because if you can't get there first, you're going to end up fouling a lot. So now we're adding the ball in. What I want to do is move the ball around, make them focus and reach out to the right or reach out to the left to catch the ball. Fabian comes out with his head up. He's looking for the ball. Sorry, 45 ahead. seconds at a time Sorry, Doug, and rest. We've lost, we've lost your screen again. So this is uh, what we call V cut or a J cut as opposed to a 360 turn behind the chair. So can you power push one pull back, one push in, one pull hard back, one push in. Sorry, Doug, um, we've lost your, your YouTube screen. Oops. Sorry, Gary. Eh. Sorry, Gary. Okay, what was your question? Trying to get Bryce off the screen here. He's on my screen. I can't get him to stop. He likes the drill too much. <laughs> All right. Mm. Can you hear the, the drill? Um, they, uh, I know what I need baby, to do. Yeah. I need to clear it out. Well... Getting out of all these. Now maybe I can. All right, did you did you have a question, Jerry? Uh, no, no question. I just um, uh, we we didn't uh, we weren't able to see your your YouTube stream. We can see your your PowerPoint screen, but not not the uh, your YouTube channel. Okay. We'll go back. So what are you seeing now? The PowerPoint screen? Yes. Hmm. Perhaps um, uh, stop sharing and then share again. So sometimes it, uh, it kicks it back in again. Sounds good. Yeah, I can't get out of it for some reason. Well, hmm.
Uh, do, do you want me to try and share the presentation on my, from our side? Yeah, might have to do that. Let me let me give it a bash. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are you on a PowerPoint slide? Yeah, I'm just uh, about to get it going there. Slideshow. Okay. All right. Can you see that? Can everybody see this? Yes, Gary. Yes, Gary, you can see it. Okay. So, so Doug, if you just want to tell me when to change or click or where to click, I'll, I'll do it from our side. Okay. Um, well, darn. Okay, you want to go ahead and share, allow the screen sharing? All right, hold on. Okay, try, try now, Doug. Okay. There we go. You can't hear the girl talking now, right? Just me? Just, yeah, we can hear just you. Okay. All right. I'll do one more. And then uh, we'll see if we have some questions. Oh. Um, can you see this one with Fabian? No. No, there's no. nothing there. Right. Nothing there. Uh, here we go. So this is one of the things go. we do for testing called ley lines. So thing about this is you want to be going straight across. Bryce started on the line. And he's drifting. He's not getting complete turns. So uh, if you go back to Fabian, Fabian's staying right between the blocks. That means he's getting a full 180 degree turn. And so on these lane lines, this is part of our testing. We'll do two minutes. We'll start, turn, turn, back to the middle of one. And most of our athletes will measure about 20 lane lines in a two minute period. So Bryce is drifting, he's not getting full turns. If you're not getting full turns, you're not getting position on defense. If you're not getting position on defense, you're drawing fouls. So I would want him to really work on his first push more. And we've been working body weight with him to get a, a faster first push. Okay, one more thing I want to share before we move on is we do preseason testing and postseason testing. And we track improvement. And I'll I'll use this to determine where we start our off-season program and what I want our guys working in the summer in their uh, summer program. So if you, if you click on that link, it would bring you to our website. And so what we do is we have some of our college testing on here. We also have some other testing. So this details our testing. We'll do a 30 minute drill. So how long does it take them to finish everything on that list? Okay, so just a, uh, a benchmark. Most of our guys will finish this right around 20 minutes. All of the items on that list. And then here's some of our other uh, testing that we do. We'll do this called the Illinois Agility Drill. 10 meters down figure eight around, figure eight back, back up 10 meters and sprint. 
So our faster guys are 22 and a half, 23 and a half seconds. And um, our newer guys will come in anywhere from 25 to 28 to 30 seconds. And so one of our goals in our, um, our process here at UTA is 75% of the athletes will show improvement in 75% of the drills. So if you go bottom, bottom down here, here's some, um, some of our male and female testing. And some of these guys are the ones that come in for camps. We'll do some testing at camps so they can see where they are as compared to where some of our college athletes are. So you see their 20 minute, or 20 minute, 20 meter sprints, anywhere from a 4.8 to 5.6, 6.1. Here's the girls. Uh, sorry, oh. Doug. Sorry, Doug, again, um, we're stuck on the other slide. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Go to that. You see this? Yeah, now we can, yeah. Okay, so this is some of our testing results. Uh, 20, 20 meter sprint, right hand sprint, left hand sprint, a 30 minute drill, which um, if you go to this link, you can see the 30 minute drill. Go back, can we see this? We on this one, uh, the drills? Yes, yeah, I can see it. Okay, all right. So we, we want to compare preseason to postseason. But this one is where some of our college athletes have been in their testing. And that's not just our athletes, it's some college athletes who come in and do our camps with us, and it's by classification. So if you go to um, www.uta.edu slash moving maths, then you can pull this up on the bottom of the first page. Um, five minute layups, we just do a cone on each block and we do how many laps can you make in five minutes? A seven minute push is just baseline to baseline as many times as you can in seven minutes. We'll also do a 12 minute push. So we set up a big figure eight and you do figure eight around the whole court. So baseline, cross, baseline, cross sideline, baseline, how many times in 12 minutes? And that isn't on here, but our quicker guys can do about 36, 36 full court figure eights in 12 minutes, all the way down to some of our new guys and some of our local pointers. 26 to 28 to 30 in 12 minutes. So I wanted to make sure and get that in there because I want you to see how we measure our success. It's not just winning. It's not just winning championships, but it is every athlete getting better? Where are they getting better? And if they're not getting better, why aren't they getting better? And this way we can break it down and it helps me figure out how to set up our workouts and our practices and our drills. All right. So questions. I know I went a little long, but you can all go to that um, YouTube channel. Yeah, th uh, thank you very much, Doug. Really appreciate it. Um, I, as, as I said, I'll just put on the chat there, I will share your presentation with, with everybody so that they can run through those links that we maybe uh, might have missed once or twice. Um, I have a question first up uh, from uh, Latabo. He's um, our, uh, part of our medical uh, team and uh, biokinetist. So go ahead, Latabo. Hi, Doug. Uh, thanks very much for the, the presentation. I uh, wanted to find out why you only do the Illinois test for agility. Why not something like the T test or a 50 or 505 or any other test, but just the Illinois one? That's a great question. And 
we've we've done the t-test um there's there's hundreds of testing you can use i think to me the key is you use the same one preseason and postseason so i like the illinois one because it requires a lot of um a lot of acceleration and deceleration and it requires i get to see how they're using their body on the figure eights and the turns um to give me an idea of what more they could do to generate power. And one of the things some of the newer guys figured out this year is the idea of deceleration because they would try to go as fast as they could around the turns and lose control of their chair. And they figured out if they decelerate just enough to get into that next turn and that next push, they could actually do the drill quicker. So uh, yeah, you're right. You can use any metric that you wanna use. Thanks very much. Um, Thank you. Very next uh, next question is from uh, Vali. Uh, hi, Doc. Just a quick question. Two quick questions on yeah. what's the recovery time between the drills you've got? Because, you know, we tend to go on and on and we've learned that there's not a way to go. You have to give the guy some recovery time between what you do to them and um what and then the second one is um the, you compare the two guys you can see the second guy's chair is not set up right that's why i can't turn quickly that is why it takes uh, uh, we call it a jippa move he, he tries to uh, compensate by turning uh, shorter or longer and not using his body weight to, to basically do the full 180 am i correct or not Right. Uh, so you're talking about Bryce and Fabian? Correct, yes. Yeah. Um, it's always interesting to, to illustrate those differences in uh, functional capacity. Uh, so what we'll do when we run that in a practice is we'll see how many turns the athlete can get in either 30, 45 seconds or a minute. So we don't compare... Uh, a Fabian to a um, to a Bryce, but if Bryce gets 14 in this section, then can he get 16 when we do it again in a month? So I'm not sure if that answered your question. Um, uh, Doc, well, what I've learned is if a chair was set up for me and I put somebody else different into my chair, they uh, find it is too um how can i say that they, they goes anywhere they say so what i'm trying to say is with fabian is it looks like his chair is set up for more straight line speed than to be able to be maneuverable um and i think sometimes uh, i hear what you say about the turns but for that short sprint you do in a quick turn he's always going to be lacking behind not because of his points but because of the setup of his chair Right. Yeah, that's true. What I want to get them to do is with our low pointers, they got to be able to stop anybody. So I want them to be able to do that move as fast as they can. I, I, it's never going to be the same, but if I can compare my four fives and my fours and my threes, then I can feel better about how they're going to play on defense. Um, but you're right, yeah. You're never gonna compare two players. All I like to do is compare their uh, their numbers this time to the next time. And what it does is it helps keep them motivated. It helps keep them uh, given 100% every time. I agree with that. And I also, I come to what your point is, um, they must be able to if you want to play the fence, stop no matter what the points are. You know, all, all goes about time and recovery. Uh, and for me, it is if, if uh, the one or two can stop a four and a half for maybe just a few seconds with somebody else to pick him up and switch over, that is what you want on the fence. I think I'm agreeing with you. I've got some background noise and I couldn't really hear all of that. Yeah, I think I think, um, I think you, you you you're on the same page there. Um, thanks. Yeah. Let me uh, let me go through to Thank to you. Musa now. 
Go ahead, Musa. Hi, Coach, are you? Hello. Hi, um, just a quick one. Um, I wanna, it's, it's, it's with the topic, but a little bit of a slide off. Um, I, I want to understand how do you, as a coach, um, distinguish between the practices whereby you dealing with physical fitness now and match fitness. Match fitness being um, able to, to, to actually, when, when you are fit physically, and because I've seen maybe um, quite a few guys, um, you could see that they are fit enough to play, but you know, like the muscles and all that they've got, but the, um, the flexibility is not there because they're, right. they're too fit. You know, so I just want to know which practices or drills we can do in order to bridge that gap. Uh, well, we'll do we'll do stretch sessions every day, and they are um, they're monitored by our athletic trainer, and we make sure that we warm up. We make sure that they follow the uh, the technical aspects of the stretch, and they go full range of motion. Uh, one of our videos is a, a band stretch. And if we don't monitor stretching, they don't go full range of motion. So we have to actually, uh, with some of them physically stretch. Uh, and then with some of them, we just have to remind them to go full range of motion on the stretch. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Um, next question is from Ellen. Go ahead, Al. Good evening, all. Uh, Coach Doug, basically, uh, I, I just want to say thank you for uh, uh, mentioning something about, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the chairs uh, um, in uh, how important it is uh, for a chair for, for an athlete. Of course, like, you know, like, um, I've noticed something um, when I was a coach of one of the uh, under 23 players, um, his day chair was in a certain angle and he is a, a, a class one and he was much quicker in his day chair than in his basketball wheelchair, which was in a certain angle. So I was like, why do we as South Africans have this thing like uh, low point is have to sit like in a particular angle, just to be in that class? Um, so some, I'm gonna to try to put this in a good political way. Some people try to uh, manipulate classification, um, but if an athlete doesn't have certain muscle function, uh, the capacity to do work, then by, changing that angle, we can facilitate uh, maybe more contact on the backrest. Or uh, if you look at function in the forward plane, then we make that angle a little bit smaller so that maybe they can push off with their breathing or with their push and get back up quicker. Um, this, is a, this is a difficult part of our sport because chairs are so expensive. Um, so we're lucky enough to have double chairs in our locker room that we can try different body positions uh, before we have a chair built to that athlete. All right, no, thank you coach, nothing much. Um, all right guys, any, any, any other questions? Going once, going twice. <laughs> um, we good? Sorry. Sorry, G, can I come go. in there? Yeah, go, go ahead, Max. Doug, when you go into camps, are you doing fitness training or are you working mainly on tactics? Or is all your fitness training done pre-season? Oh, Did you get sorry. that? Sorry. Was your, Jerry, your what the question? Um, uh, Doug, uh, Max is asking, um, your fitness training portion of, of what you've been talking about, 
Um, is that done during your sort of during your season, uh, in, or, or if you if you're camping, or is that done um, you know uh, pre pre season effectively? The the pre season uh, workouts. Well, yeah, just so so uh, what Max is saying. So so from our perspective. Um, we only have a limited number of camps each year from, from a, a national team perspective, centralized camps where players come from all over the country. Um, uh, the idea is that um, at that camp, um, we, what we are saying is we, we haven't got time to, to do the fitness element of it because there's just not enough time. So, so right. do, do you do the same scenario um, or is, is the fitness, uh, you know, uh, d done on their own t uh, own time, or you know, obviously the, the colleges are slightly different because you have them there on, on a daily basis. Um, but from a from a national setup, uh, what would what would your suggestion be to to stay fit? Yeah, I'm lucky enough to. Uh, I mean, they live here, and so they're here every day. Uh, but I agree, it's kind of a philosophical thing. Do you want to use your camps to? get as much work as you can, like maybe three, three hour sessions, or uh, is it quantity versus quality? And I think that's a philosophical thing. And that's one reason I started doing the, uh, the uh, YouTube videos so that when they come to our camps, they know the drills and they can take them home and work on them because, because you're right. If they don't take it home and work on it, they don't get better. So, we try to tell our camps that we do military camps, we do girls camps, uh, junior camps and adult camps. And, and we tell them like, you're gonna be exhausted when you leave here, but if you don't take these drills home, it, uh, you're not gonna maximize the, uh, the information. Does that uh, answer your question there, Max? <clears throat> yeah, it's just that, you know, you know me, I don't do fitness. You guys must get fit before you come to camp, and I'm just going to work on tactics and polish tactics yeah. and skills. All right, great. Thanks. Um, all right, and then um, I've got a question here. Uh, go ahead, Natalie. Um, what was that? Good evening, Coach Doug. Um, I've got a question. Um, you mentioned earlier on with the body weight for the junior uh, players. From when, from what age do you incorporate more weight to the training regime? Yeah, I think the resistance training you do when they're younger, you do it maybe as negatives. So maybe a chin up and then you go negative just with body weight. Uh, when they get past puberty, more into uh, the 15, 16 year old age range, that's where you can start adding some, um, some resistance, some weights, um, ankle weights, uh, different types of resistance. The problem I have on my side is that um, um, even of my 15 year old, 16, 17 year olds, they are still very tiny. Their bodies still look like nine, 10 years old. Is it okay then to start them on that or not? Can you can you uh, redo that, Jerry? I couldn't yeah, hear sure. it all. Um, um, uh, Doug, so uh, what Natalie is saying is some of her, her 15, 16 year old players are very tiny um, for whatever reason. Um, and she was just concerned, uh, is it still okay then, even though they, they are old enough to start doing weight training or whatever uh, resistance training? Um, yeah. if, they are t or if they are tiny people, you know, individuals, is it advisable or not? Yeah, and the, the younger they are, then the more recovery time they're gonna get. But um, it's not necessarily a size thing as it is a, a, a physical maturity factor. How, uh, are they still growing? Are their growth plates still open on their bones so that we're not tearing something at the, the point of insertion of the, the growth plate? So you do want to be really careful about that in the younger ones. And I'd say spend more time on the, the body weight type activities uh, and the repetitions than actually the heavier weights. Yeah. Thank that, you, that Coach. Yeah, Much appreciated. Makes, makes sense, yeah. Um, all right, guys, any, any, anybody else got some questions? Uh, one more, G. Go ahead. Do they, does Doug, Doug, do you monitor diet at all? 
Do I what? Monitor diet. Diet. Oh, yeah. So um, that, that's a tricky point, Max. It's a tricky point. Um, we introduce diet. We have interns who come in who are kinesiology majors or maybe they're um, public health majors and they work with our athletes on diet. Uh, but what we try to work on is um, specific nutrition program rather than a diet. Like we want a nutrition program where they're gonna have energy for practice. We want them to, um, maybe they wanna add muscle mass. So we look at the timing of the, the nutrient timing. So are they eating the right things before practice, after practice, and are they maximizing nutrition specifically for their own personal goals? But yeah, that's a, a pretty big part of our college program here, yes. All right, great. Um, all right, guys. Um, one last one last call for questions, um, and then we can uh, we can wrap it up. All right, that's it. Cool. Thank you very much. So, I miss um, that. Doug, um, it was just just uh, just to wrap everything up. Uh, thank you so much for your your time and uh, uh, imparting uh, some of uh, the knowledge that you have um, and. Um, you know, again, for, for giving us your support. We do appreciate it. And um, hopefully we can uh, look to do some more sessions with you going forward. And, uh, and again, we do, do appreciate everything. Um, yeah, so on behalf of WBSA, I'd just like to say thank you very much. Yeah, uh, and feel free to share my email. Anybody's, anybody can email me with specific questions that, uh, that they would like to address maybe outside the group. Be happy to answer. Awesome. Thank you. We, we really do appreciate it. So, Thanks yeah. for having me. Good Thank luck you. in your season, everybody. Thanks, Doug. And, uh, Thanks, you, Doug. You too.